Hello, and welcome to Verifying RTOS Applications Using Deep Insight Analysis. I'm Jacob Beningo, and I'm going to be your lecturer for today's course. Now, before we dive in, I'd like to take just a moment to thank Sager Microcontroller. They are a partner of mine in putting together this webinar, and they provided me with a lot of great insights into how we can actually dive in and verify real-time operating system-based applications. They even introduced me to this new term, Deep Insight Analysis, which is one of the things that we're going to cover in depth in today's lecture. Now, when I first started talking with Sager, I thought that they were just a company that produced debugging tools. But after a very quick discussion with them, I discovered that they've been around for 25 years and don't just do debugging tools, but have actually developed a lot of fail-safe software stacks, such as SD card stacks, a real-time operating system of their own, amongst many other types of tools. So I am very appreciative in all the help and support that they provided me in order to help pull together this webinar today. Now, before we dive in, just a few housekeeping items for you. If at any point during the lecture you have a question, please feel free to use the question box to ask that question. We have some colleagues of mine on site along with engineers from Sager who will be able to answer any questions that you might have about deep insight analysis, about tools, about software. So please don't be shy. The more interaction, the better. Now, after the lecture, if you happen to have questions, you can always feel free to contact me. All you need to do is email me at jacobatbeningo.com and I'll get back to you as quickly as possible. Now, in today's session, this is what we're going to cover. We're going to explore how we can debug and verify RTOS-based applications using deep insight analysis. And very shortly here, I'm going to define exactly what deep insight analysis is for you. But some of the topics that we are going to cover, I'm going to start out doing a little bit of a review. So what I want to do is walk through how we can go about selecting a real-time operating system in a manner that actually analyzes the data and the software itself. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to look at techniques for creating and scheduling tasks. So I'm going to talk a little bit about rate monotonic analysis and scheduling. I'm going to review some basic RTOS features such as mutexes, semaphores, and message queues. This will help set the stage then with a base application that we can then analyze. So we'll look at a basic introduction to application debugging techniques using things like application tracing. We'll take a look at how we get started with deep insight analysis, which goes even deeper into the system, being able to verify timing, even looking at uh, application profiling. And then we'll at the very end talk about best practices for verifying RTOS-based applications. Now, everything that we're going to cover today, I've set up so that it can be done in a hands-on manner. There's one, it's always one thing for me to lecture and say, hey, these are the things that we should do, versus always going out and trying it yourself and seeing how the techniques really work and the tools. So one of, all of the examples that I'm going to show, I'm going to show a number of demos throughout the course of the lecture. All, all of that material I've set up code for on a Sager M Power Board. Uh, I had access to a JTrace tool, so I'm using a JTrace. Now, you can, if you don't have access to those, maybe you just have some type of ARM-based development board and a, a J-Link on board or maybe your own uh, J-Link. You can still use those to follow along uh, for most of the demonstrations I'm going to show you. It's really the instruction tracing when we get to the uh, deepest level of deep insight analysis that you really need the, uh, the J-Trace to get full tracing capabilities. But that's the hardware that I'm using for the hands-on examples. And then I also... Uh, I'm using Embedded Studio, MBOS, and System View, all from Sager. Usually these webinars, I go out to a, you know five or six different places and we're pulling all these tools. In today's webinar, we've made it very simple. We go to one place, they're all, all the tools are easily accessible to us and it should get you up and running very easily uh, if you wanna follow along at a, at a later time. So what is this whole thing about deep insight analysis? Now, one of the things that I've experienced in industry quite a bit is that we go through and we develop software and we have no way to actually see how the software is executing. I write some code. I try to create some test cases around it. I don't have a real good way to verify that my test cases actually hit all my lines of code. Um, so what I do is I try to go through and do some basic debugging. I put some breakpoints in. And I do some things that are generally pretty inefficient to understand how my application's working. Pretty much what happens is when I hit the run button on my application, I cross my fingers and I hope for the best. I just assume that it's behaving the way I expect it to and following the the expected program path. Now, deep insight analysis goes beyond that. We're no longer just hoping that the application works. We're gonna visually inspect and verify that our application is doing what it's supposed to. And there's a lot of benefits to this. If I can see what's happening in my code, 
I can make debugging a lot easier. I can see where the actual problem is without then having to guess 10 times in a row. Well, maybe it's this or maybe it's that. Oh, nope, I made a mistake over here. So the whole point, the very first step in deep sight insight analysis is to use RTOS aware debugging. And I'm going to talk a lot about each of these in detail throughout the course of the webinar. But to give you a little idea, RTOS aware debugging allows us to see the actual data structures inside the RTOS and see what's happening with the different tasks and the uh, primitives of the RTOS. Then kind of as we move deeper into a, a deeper analysis, we have runtime analysis. And this starts to provide us with the timing of those tasks and how they're executing. We get min and max times, the stacks, you know, how much stack space is being used. What's the order that the different tasks are executing? We can visually see our code executing. We can see when an interrupt fires. How long is that interrupt? When does the scheduler actually run? How long is the scheduler making decisions on what tasks should be running next? So it is a way for us to actually visually see what's going on in our application, which I've been using for some time now. And it, I'm telling you, it drastically decreases how much time I spend debugging when I can see how my code is actually flowing through and executing. Now, the final and kind of the deepest step is where we're doing profiling and, and code coverage analysis. And this is really the, ver the final verification stage. So our trust aware debugging, the runtime analysis, that's really helping us develop our application and understand how it's behaving and getting rid of all the bugs. At the very end, we profile and we do code coverage to see, did we actually, did we actually run test cases against every line of code? You know, how many iterations is a particular function being called? It allows me to profile and see how well my test cases are in the code execution path is. And if I run into a problem, I can even go into the lowest levels and do instruction tracing where I see every single instruction that the microcontroller executed. These are the kind of the three pillars of deep insight analysis. And that's really what we're going to focus on for most of this lecture. Now, before we dive into all the details of deep insight analysis, I want to, I do want to review some basics of real-time operating systems and how we can get one set up and create a application. The first thing I want to do is spend some time discussing how to select a real-time operating system. We all know that we typically select a component or an operating system based on one particular feature, cost. And that is not the correct way to choose a real-time operating system. We really should be looking at our end application along with some key critical criteria. For example, we should be looking at the performance of the real-time operating system, its features, the different costs associated with it, the ecosystem that surrounds it. We should be looking at the middleware that's supported by the real-time operating system. We all know that integrating different components that aren't designed to work together can be a very time-consuming and costly endeavor. So we wanna make sure that all of the TCP IP stacks and the USB and graphic controls that that's all supported by our real-time operating system in an easily and integrated way. Very similar to how MVOS is, which is the operating system I'm gonna be talking about during our webinar. We also wanna make sure that the vendor has a good track record, a history that we can be well supported and that we don't have to just go out to a forums and hope that someone's gonna help us. Then we also need to take into account factors about the engineer and even the labor intensity that they're gonna to have to go through to get the real-time operating system up and running. Now, within each of these primary categories, we want to go through and actually rate the real-time operating system that we're interested in using. And we can do this by going through and looking at these different criteria, these major categories, and saying, okay, I want to look at my real-time operating system. You know, how important is a small RAM foot to me? If I'm in a resource-constrained system, I want a small RAM footprint. I want a small ROM footprint. Uh, we're going to be using MBOS in our examples today. And one of the things that really surprised me about MBOS was that it uses barely no RAM, and the ROM footprint is very small. It's actually the smallest that I've seen in the industry, something around the lines of 12 kilobytes of code space for a lot of functionality. Typically, I would expect to see twice that much. So we want to go through and evaluate that. Maybe if that code size is important to us, if we're in a very resource-constrained system, that should be more important than the overall cost of the actual operating system. We also want to take a look at different features that are involved in our system and also rank how important are those to our system. You know, is it is the OS easy to scale into different applications or is it very rigid in the way that it's constructed? You know, are there a lot of processor derivatives that are fully supported? One of the things that we're going to see when we go down and set up MOS is that they're, it's supported by nearly every single processor imaginable in the embedded space. So we want to go through and we want to rank how important these different characteristics are to our application. And don't get me wrong, cost is very important to a lot of development cycles, but we need to take a look at and rank how that actually fits with the other characteristics that are important to our application. 
cost shouldn't be the singular determining factor for us. We really need to consider the total cost of ownership of our entire system. And while we might say that we could go out and get a free OS, it may turn out that we're going to spend 10 times as much trying to integrate different components into it in order to actually use it successfully in our, op in our application. So what we should be doing when we're selecting our operating system is we should be looking at these different characteristics, ranking how important they are to us, and then going through and getting together with our colleagues, our coworkers, and going through and evaluating the different real-time operating systems we're interested in and weighing how well that those operating systems actually fit into the performance and the features, the cost and the ecosystem requirements that we have for our application. What's gonna, what you're gonna find is that the results are really going to surprise you. In many circumstances, I've actually found that a commercial real-time operating system provides the better bang for, for the buck than a free real-time operating system. Simply because a lot of times you have a lot of extra integrations that can come together with a commercial OS and the, between the support and those integration efforts, a huge amount of time can be saved. Not to mention the robustness of commercially available products. Now I'm not trying to steer you in any particular direction, but what I'm trying to recommend is that you take a very close look at how you go about selecting your different components and your real-time operating systems and perform an engineering analysis and make the decision once you go through and you weigh all these different characteristics and features, you can sum them all up and you can actually compare numerical values to see which RTOS actually best fits your application. Every RTOS is not equivalent. They are all very different in feature sets and their functionality and how well and robust they are and how efficient they are in the way they operate in a microcontroller environment. So I highly encourage you to take a look at that. And we're going to be looking at MBOS today, uh, which is one example of a very robust and small footprint real-time operating system. Now, if you want to go through and be able to perform this analysis yourself, what I recommend is that you go to my website, Beningo.com, and under Insights and Toolkits, you can find a, a, a RTOS selection matrix. It's just in an Excel sheet, and you can go through and enter in the data for your own development efforts. Once we've gone through and we've selected an RTOS, we've, we've got an application that we want to design, we go through and we parse up our application in different tasks, and now we need to decide what priority level should we set for those different tasks. Now, one method that can be used to help us there is to use rate monotonic scheduling. And this is basically a scheduling algorithm designed to assign static priorities to tasks in an application. And what we can do when we create these different tasks and we start to uh, use rate monotonic analysis is we can calculate out the CPU utilization and determine is it even possible to schedule all these tasks on this particular microcontroller. And we can go through and calculate this and use rate monotonic scheduling as long as we assume four different things. First, we start out saying that we're not going to share any resources amongst the different tasks. Second, that all deadlines are going to be deterministic in our system. Three, we assume static priorities. And four, that context switch times are negligible in the application. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to assign the highest priorities to the uh, shortest duration tasks. And as we then go in and we add the different interactions, we may find that we need to make some adjustments to the way that we assign the priorities to those tasks. But it does provide us at least with a first off way to go through and schedule these. One of the ways that we can do this, there's a couple things. Maybe I have three tasks in my application. I need to know what the execution time is for each of those tasks, what the period is for, those, for, for how often that task executes, and then I can calculate the utilization of the CPU for that. So for example, task one, if it executes at uh, 15, you know, maybe it's 15 milliseconds uh, execution time or 15 microseconds. We put this as the, the highest priority task, followed by task two, followed by task three, since the execution periods get lar larger here. Now then what we can go through and do is we can say, okay, I'm going to calculate what the period is. So maybe this runs every, you know, has a frequency of 100 hertz, 150 or 300. And then I can use the, this period here to calculate out what the actual utilization is for each task of the CPU. Now, if I sum all those up, I'm gonna get some value. A utilization of one means that we are, you know, using the entire 100% CPU. There's a maximum limit based on the number of tasks in the system to calculate the most CPU utilization that we can actually use um, using rate monotonic scheduling. And what we have here, you can see here, this is the equation on the left-hand side. To calculate that out, you can see with one task, one task can use the whole CPU. Two, it can only utilize the CPU to 0.828. You gotta remember there's some context switches and there could be other things going on. So if you have an infinite number of tasks, 
the maximum utilization is approximately 69.3%. So as we look here, what we wanna do is if I have three tasks, I can come to this table here and say, okay, I need to make sure that if I have three tasks, the total CPU utilization is less than 0.779. I calculated out that, okay, yes, these tasks are gonna use 0.52. So as I look at this, theoretically, these tasks should be schedulable, schedulable in my application. Now you might recall that in general, there's four categories that we can find in real-time operating systems that we can use to synchronize different tasks. The first are semaphores, which are really used for synchronization and notification. Generally, we think of this as tokens that tokens or flags that we're gonna pass around. Uh, we can give and we can take them between different tasks. So we can have counting semaphores or we can have binary semaphores where we just go uh, have a token that we give and take. There can only be one maximum one. We can also have uh, mutexes, which provide mutual exclusion to lock and unlock a resource. Now, semaphores and mutexes are different in that mutexes have the ability to provide priority inheritance which can be used to minimize the impact of a priority inversion in an application. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the issues that we can discover using deep insight analysis like priority inversion a little bit later. We also have message queues, which can be used to communicate between two different tasks. So if I have data maybe that I've received or I wanna transmit a message, uh, just like we're going to do actually a little bit later in some of the examples, I can pass that message from one task to another and have one task acting as a gatekeeper while maybe another task is acting as a controller telling the gatekeeper what it should be doing. And then finally, we have event flags, which are a good way to synchronize tasks as well. Basically, event flags just use a single bit to synchronize tasks and their behavior. So instead of having, you know, they help save memory um, and they're very fast and efficient. So we've been reviewing a little bit about how real-time operating systems work, how we can select one. Let's dive in and actually show an example how we can set up MOS and on the M power board here. Now, just to give you a little bit of an idea here, there's a lot of features actually on this M power board. You can see there's expansion slots and user SD cards and USB and ethernet and a whole bunch of buttons and, and things. Everything in green here is what we're actually going to be using in today's demonstration. So I'm using an external J trace, which I'm putting through this, uh, through this ETM connector, the J tag. Uh, so we're gonna be using that. I have a user button that can optionally be used. It's actually when you push it, it's gonna fire, uh, trans, basically put a, uh, a semaphore and then a different task is gonna wait on the semaphore and then it's gonna kick off a bunch of control over the LEDs. Setting up MOS on any target development board is gonna take us less than five minutes. The process is very simple. The first thing that we're gonna to wanna to do is go to the Sager website and then we're going to wanna to go to the downloads tab and find the MOS icon. Once we find it, we're gonna go ahead and select it. This is gonna bring us to the page that has the manual, software, and also a number of trials that we can download in order to work with any development kit or any microcontroller or processor that we might happen to be using. So what we're gonna to wanna to do is we're gonna to wanna to scroll through all the different options. You can see here we have a ton of different ports for a bunch of different microcontrollers, Cortex-A9 processors. Since the M power board is a Cortex M processor, we're gonna to wanna to look for the M OS trial version for the ARM Cortex M. So as we scroll down through here, you can see, ah, here's a whole bunch of ARM Cortex M trials. As you can see, there's a ton of different ports for different IDEs as well and different co compilers. So what we're gonna to wanna to do is look through for the compiler of our choice. For today's demos, we're gonna be looking at using the Seger Embedded Studio. So here's the Embed OS trial for Cortex M with Sager Embedded Studio. So this is gonna be the option that I wanna select here. Really simple, all I need to do is go and click the download button. This button will then take me to a page where I fill in some basic information and then it provides me with a free download of the MOS RTOS. Now, had I been using a different IDE or compiler, I could easily go and find one for, for IAR or for Kyle, or if I had a completely different processor, like an S12 with CodeWire, for example, a ton of different ports are available for nearly any imaginable uh, microcontroller or regular CPU. So once I go through and I download that, what I would find is that I'd end up with this folder. It's MOS Cortex M ES trial. The version happens to be uh, 4.36. So what I'm gonna wanna do is take a look and see what's actually included in this trial download. Now, the nice thing about this, we can get up and running very quickly. We have all the information that we need in this download. As you can see here, we have release notes, we have a license, 
And most importantly, we actually have the user manual already included and ready for us to use. So it looks here, you can see here, we got a bunch of user information. Where do I want to actually start at? And it turns out I just go into the start folder. Now I have a lot of different options, a, a couple of options here. I have a library folder, an include folder. A lot of this is just to support the MOS RTOS. What I really want to look at is board support. As I come into the board support folder, you can see there's a number of different options for me for different microcontrollers that are ARM Cortex-M based to get up and running. So for example, if I decide that I was going to use an NXP board, I could come into the NXP section here. Maybe I go and grab a K26 Freedom board or a K24 one, or maybe I have a tower module. I could just go into these particular folders, and what I would find is that I already have a project ready to start and get myself up and running. So since I'm using the M Power board from Sager, I'm going to go into the Sager folder, and I'm going to say, oh, I'm using the M Power board, and then this has everything that I need to get set up and running quickly. I have a default project, which I can easily then use as a starting project to get the RTOS up and running. So let's actually take a look and see how this looks. Now, the first thing that we're going to notice is that by default, this project has a bunch of different files already associated with it. The first thing we might notice is that we have this OS start LED blink. Now, if I go through and I open that particular C module, I'm going to find this is where all of my t initial tasks and my main function already is set up for me. We'll take a look at this in a little bit more detail here in a moment. We can see that I already have my device startup here. So I have Kinetis K60 on this particular development kit, the M power board. The startup code is already here. The interrupt vector is already set up. Some libraries to run MOS are already included. And then there's some basic setup files as well. There's a BSP.C module that contains some basic helper functions to control the LEDs and various features on the development board. There's also a hard fault handler. We have the ability to detect OS errors. And we also here have a whole bunch of Sager modules here that are going to allow us later on when we start talking about application tracing and application analysis, these are going to help us get that data up to our system viewer. So looking here in the OS start LED blink.c module, what I'm going to find here is I have two different tasks that are created and are going to blink an LED. Now the first task is going to be HP task. It's a high priority task. And all this thing is going to do is it's going to toggle one of the LEDs on the board at 50 milliseconds. Then we're going to have a low priority task that's going to toggle a different LED at about 200 milliseconds. So this is going to be the basic setup of my two tasks. This is going to be the function code. I have my main function, which is going to go and initialize the kernel. So we're going to initialize the operating system, initialize any hardware specific to the M power board, initialize the LED. So we're going to do a BSP init, and then we're going to create the two tasks that are in our system. So as I mentioned, we have high priority task and low priority task. So I'm going to make a call to OS create task. I need a task control block for each of these different tasks. So what you can see here is up near the top, we actually have a couple of variables declared, OS stack pointer, and we've created a stack pointer for the, the high stack, uh, for the high priority task and the low priority task. And in this case for right now, we're arbitrarily providing them with a stack size of 128. We're going to explore that a little bit when we take a look at OS aware debugging. So I've created that, and I also need to create a, a task control block handler. So I'm going to create OS task, and I'm going to create a uh, test control block for the high priority and the low priority. So these are going to be the two variables that I have to set up in order to create a task. Once I do that, a simple call to OS create task. We're going to pass in a pointer to our task control block. We're going to provide a name for our task so that in like any context that we're already debugging, we can see simple text on what the, what the task is actually doing. I'm going to then pass in the function that should be executed when the task comes due and is ready to execute. And then I can provide a priority level. Now, the higher the priority level, um, that's the, the higher that number, the higher the priority level is going to be. So in this case, my high priority task, I'm setting at a priority level of 100. My low priority task, I'm setting at a, a value of 50. And then you can see here, we need to supply a stack when we create the uh, task. And we've created that variable, as I mentioned, with 128 integers in order for the stack depth there. And at that point, we have tasks that are created, and then we can go through and we can make a call to OS start. That's gonna start MOS, and then it's gonna go through and perform its own priority-based scheduling for us. So from this environment, one of the first things I wanna do, I wanna come up with a build. I wanna make sure that I have a clean solution, go and build again, rebuild my solution. You can see 
we went through, the code was compiled. You can see the, the code size here. So we got a code size of about 22 kilobytes, which is pretty small, and uh, data of 6.6K. You can see the breakdown here on the left-hand side. Very useful, especially if you're in an application where maybe you have a processor with not a whole lot of code space. You can easily come in here and try to figure out where uh, the largest code is actually being used at. Now, since we've already gone through and done that, there are a couple options of debug. We could just say debug and go, or we can go on the right-hand side here and just click go right from the IDE. Very quickly, we see that our code gets uh, loaded up onto the development board. On the left-hand side, I can see all the disassembly for this particular application, which is very helpful and useful. We've ran to main. On the right-hand side, I can see my where I can debug my registers. I have local variables here as well, and the ability to add extra watches into my system so I can see what is going on. Call stack is located on the bottom right here underneath my code, and I'm ready to start running my application. So I can go ahead and click continue. And at this point, as you can see on my development kit, the lights are blinking, just LED zero and LED one. LED zero is blinking far faster uh, than LED one, which is what we're expecting in our basic application. And as you can see here, basically right out of the box, we've got MOS set up and ready to run. So I have a nice project here on a development kit that was already pre-coined and developed by Sager to help me get up and running. So now what we want to do is go through and build an application that's maybe a little bit more complex uh, to, in order to review some of our RTOS, RTOS concepts. And I've actually pre-developed an application that I'll walk you through and describe you know, the way I was thinking through the RTOS, some of the different features of it. That way we just get back on the same page and reviewing these concepts. So as you can see here, this looks almost exactly like the same project that we just had opened. Except the difference is that I came in and I used that default project as a template to start creating my new project. So I have all of the initial board support still in here. I even decide, hey, start LED blink. All this application is going to do is blink an LED. So why not leave that name even the same as well? Now, this particular tat, this particular application is going to do something a little bit different than the last one. What I want to do is I want to create one task that's going to act as a gatekeeper over all the LEDs on the board. I'm going to create another task that works as an LED controller. And this LED controller is going to, depending on how I compile the code, it's either going to wait for a button press to then send a bunch of messages through a message queue to the uh, LED gatekeeper. Or if I don't want to wait on the semaphore and I just want the LEDs to constantly scroll, then what I can do is have the LED controller go through and constantly cycle different messages, which are going to tell which LEDs should be turned on and for how long. And then that task is going to basically be the LED controller, which passes data to the LED gatekeeper, which is going to be waiting on a message before executing any code. So let's take a look at how this actually works. Now, as I mentioned in the main function here, it looks exactly like we just saw. We have an initialization of the kernel, the hardware, the BSP. Now I have two different tasks. One, as I mentioned, is going to be the LED gatekeeper. This one actually controls the LEDs. I want that to have a slightly higher priority than the actual controller. The controller is just deciding which LED should be turned on and for how long, but it doesn't have access or control to the low level hardware to actually turn them on or off. That's the sole role of the gatekeeper in this example. So I'm going to go and create both those tasks. You can see I gave them a nice name. In this case, I, it only has two tasks again. So I'm keeping TCB high priority and low priority here, setting the priority levels as 150, but I can change them to anything. I could have priority of one and two or a hundred and a thousand if I wanted to. It's really up to me as a developer to decide how I want to do that. Now, in this case, I'm also going to go through and I'm going to create a, a message queue. Now, we can create message queues in this example by making a call to OS underscore Q underscore create. And in this case, we're going to want to pass in a pointer to the actual message queue. We're going to want to pass in a pointer to where the data is stored, and then also a pointer for the size of the data, um, the, the memory queue buffer that, it, that can be used in order to pass messages between different tasks. As I mentioned before, if we want to, we could, in this application, create a basic semaphore and have a button press that when the button gets pressed, it sends a semaphore, a counting semaphore, that is then watched for by the LED controller. And when that occurs, it then sends a series of messages over to the LED gatekeeper task. In this case, I wanna, I'm gonna make a call to OS underscore create C semaphore. And I'm gonna create also a variable 
um, button semaphore, which is going to hold the semaphore count. I'm going to initialize it here to zero. Okay, so I've gone through, I've created these, these tasks, I've got some uh, semaphores. So now let's take a look at the code that is going to be the LED controller. Now the LED controller, I'm going to create an LED message type. I'm also going to create a pointer to that LED message. This area here is going to be my main task code. Remember, I want to make a good for loop that I'm going to be looping through. I mentioned that I may want to wait for a button press to blink the LED. So you can see here, I have the option to make a call to OS underscore wait C semaphore and wait on the button semaphore. So what would happen is this task would get to a point where, hey, I'm waiting on a counting semaphore and it's just going to wait until someone pushes a button. We then have a semaphore given. There'd be a semaphore there. The task would then take it and would be able to execute the code. Now, all this code is doing, I want to do something simple. So I'm going to just create a for loop that's going to turn on each of the LEDs in a row. Uh, what I'm going to do is turn it on, turn it off, then turn the next one on, turn the next one off, turn the next one on, then that one off, kind of over and over again in a sequence so that they're, they're turned on in a series. What I want to do is I want to set up my message first. So I'm going to take LED message LED and say, okay, whatever LED message it is, I can set the state to turn the state on here. And then I'm going to say whatever the message del the time delay is. In this case, 50. Now, what I want to do here is I want to make a call to OS. I want to be able to send this message from the LED controller over to the LED gatekeeper task. Now, in order to do that, what I'm going to do is make a call to OS underscore Q underscore put. I'm going to specify which message queue it is. I'm going to pass in a pointer to the data that I'm using. And I need to let it know what the size of the data is that I'm going to be sending. Once I've gone through and done that, this code would be executed. We delay this task to give the gatekeeper time to go through and execute it. And what we would find then is that the high priority task should take over in either way because it's going to be waiting. As you can see here, we got an LED gatekeeper task. Its main code is going to wait for a pointer for a message to get put into that queue. And when it does, when there's a message there, it's going to go out there and it's going to put that message into this message pointer, which is a local pointer to the data that's going to be stored. So once I have that, I can go through, we can dereference the message pointer to get the state of the LED and what LED should be on right here. We'll turn the LED on or off and depending on which one it is. Once we've consumed the message and we've done what we need to do with it, we make a call to OSQ purge and we specify which LED queue it is. That's going to go through and eliminate that. And then I'm going to delay this task, um, whatever the amount of time it was that was requested in the message. So at this point, the thing to do would be to try this out. I can go through again just to do a quick build, and then I can go through and run the code. So I'm at my main application now, and if I go ahead and click the Run button, you can see here I get a sequence of events just as I would expect. Uh, LED 0, then LED 1, then 2, then 3, and then repeating. So I successfully have communication between the LED controller and also the LED gatekeeper with a couple of tasks and also some synchronization tools within the operating system. Now, one thing that I'd like to show you before we move on and start examining how we can analyze this application and really start to dive into the deep insight analysis is I want to show you what happens if I made a mistake somewhere in my code. There's a really neat feature of MOS where if I had forgotten to purge the, the message that was being stored here. So the message queue at this point, I forgot to say, I forgot to grab, I grabbed the message, but I never said, hey, I'm done with the message. So my, my message is actually going to be, my, or my queue is going to be in use when it comes back through and a new message is available and I try to grab it. So what's going to happen here, so it's going to happen here if I rerun this code, I'm going to go ahead and click run. And instead of seeing a bunch of blinking LEDs, I see I got the LED one and my application stopped. Now what on earth is going on here? If I come in here and I click the pause button, I can see that I'm inside this OS error function. And this is a catch within the MOS where I get a nice error code. And if I click and highlight over here, I get the error OS error queue in use. And this immediately points me to a problem with my message queue. And if I didn't know what was going on, or this was the first time I was using this operating system, all I had to do was go into the user manual. I did a search for this code and I discovered, oh, you know what? I actually have to clear out the queue and let it know that I'm done using it. Now, the first pillar of deep insight analysis is going to be to perform OS aware debugging. And OS aware debugging is basically integrated debugging that provides access to OS structures and data. 
So for example, this is a screenshot from within Embed Studio where I'm performing OS Aware debugging. You can see here that I can see the priority of a task. So I'm getting task description blocks, IDs, the name of the actual task. I can see the status information. So if a task was actually executing, it would show that it's executing. In this case, it's delayed. I can see different execution statistics. How many times has this task actually executed? Along with information like events that are occurring and even the stack info. As you can imagine, this is extraordinary, can be extremely important. This can allow us to help size our stack, which I'm going to demonstrate here to you in just a moment. What I have here in front of me is the application that we just looked at. But what we're going to do here, when I run the application this time, I want to perform OS aware debugging. I want to be able to see what my tasks are actually doing. How much stack space are they using? So in order to do this, I've already set up the debug environment, so I'm ready to hit run at any time here. But I want to go through and navigate to the view that will let me see my threads. So what I'm going to do is come up into the file menu. I'm going to say view. I'm going to go down to more debug windows, and I'm going to select threads. Now, what happens here is on the right-hand side of the screen, I end up with this threads tab here now. And you can see, just like on the slide we just looked at, I can see a priority, an ID, name, status, timeout, etc. But there's no information there yet. And the reason for that is that I have to actually run my application to see what's going on. So I'm going to go through and hit the run button. We can see here I get a status change. We're running. And what I can do then is pause my code. And now I can see here what's going on. I can see my tasks list. I can see where they exist in memory or the ID that's provided them. I can see the actual name which is why it's a good idea to provide your tasks with a descriptive name when you create them. I can see their current state. Is that actually running? Is it delayed for some reason? Maybe one is waiting on a semaphore or it's just waiting for time to expire. We can see the timeout associated with it. And I think one of the most critical and useful applications for this is going to be, we can see the stack info. One of the things that I could do or that I see happen a lot in industry is people just guess at the stack space that they need. They have a simple task that's going to blink an LED and they say, oh, I'm going to give it 512 bytes or a kilobyte worth of stack space. When in fact, they probably only need, you know, 64 or 128 bytes of memory for their stack space, especially if they're just blinking an LED. But one of the great things about this is that I could run my code and I could run it through all of its test cases and really try to figure out, you know, really put it through its paces. And then I can pause and I can see how much stack space I actually use. And we can see here that our LED gatekeeper task is using about 180, 180 bytes worth of stack space. The LED controller task is using 188 out of 512. So in this particular instance, I'm probably wasting a bunch of memory and oversizing the stack for these tasks. So what I could then do is I could then stop the application from running, set it this time to maybe 64. Now I'm going to go back and rebuild, run, and now when I go ahead and click run, my application's still running, but do I have enough stack space left? So I can go ahead and click pause, and I can see that I probably have just the right amount here. I'm using 256, a uh, maximum of 256. I got 180 bytes or 188 bytes, so I could maybe tone it down a little bit more, but just in case something really strange happened, I do want to leave a little bit of extra buffer space there. And that's one of the cool things about being able to do OS aware debugging. I can actually see what's going on with my tasks, see the stack info, see what the timeouts are, and a lot of other pieces of information that's useful for us when we're debugging our system. Now, OS aware debugging, as you saw, really provides us with some, some basic details into the uh, RTOS and how it's behaving. But it really doesn't provide us with a lot of information about our application. And this is where the second pillar of deep insight analysis comes in, application tracing application tracing is a way for recording and visualizing system events, which can then be used to debug and verify an application. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, 10 years ago, we'd go through and we designed an application. We'd basically hit the run button and then cross our fingers and we couldn't see what was going on. We'd have to blink LEDs and, you know, try to put printfs in and, you know, put all do go through a lot of effort to try to figure out if the program flow was actually correct. If something was wrong, then we spent a lot of time trying to, you know, move things around in order to figure out what was actually wrong. 
This is why I love application tracing. It allows me to actually see what on earth is going on in my application. Now, the application tracing itself is basically recording events. There's software, a little piece of very efficient software that exists on the microcontroller, and it transmits a, a timestamp and event information back up through the debugger, which is then received by tracing software, which can then reconstruct the event that occurred, and, it vis and then it displays it visually on the screen. So you can see here as an example, some data was received. You can see here that this is a system tick here, then the scheduler executed, then a, a, a high priority task executed. We can even see here these little darker blocks here. This is where there's different RTOS features occurring, like maybe entering into the, the task, maybe a semaphore being given, exiting the task, and so on and so forth. But you can see here, visually seeing what the application is doing, it can be extraordinarily useful and help discover bugs a lot faster than just trying to guess on where something could be going. And there's a lot of different types of events that application tracing can provide. We can see when a task changes state, like we just saw. We can see interrupts occurring, like the system tick. We can see when a semaphore is being given and taken, when mutexes are being locked and unlocked, when messages are being signaled, so if you have a message queue, and we can see the RTO RTOS scheduler status. And there's a lot more than that that we can see as well. So one of the one of the tools I'm going to be showing off to you here is going to be System View, and System View allows us here, as you can see, to see individual events in a list. So I can see here the timestamp information. It's provided with an ID. It actually provides context as to what is it that's going on. Is it a system tick? Is it a scheduler? Is it a you know the name of the task? So I can get that context information, event data. And then some, a little bit of data on what was actually happening during that event. So I can easily have a log of everything that's happened in my program since the start of the program itself, since boot up, which is a great way to be able to figure out or find problems or even verify that your application is behaving as expected. Second, we have uh, the actual timeline. So just like I showed on the previous slide, we can see the different entities that are inside of our application and then go through and see how they actually look and how they're interacting with each other. As we see this interaction, there's also a CPU load graph which shows us how heavily loaded the CPU is. We can see here that all at once there was a bunch of loading. The CPU ran at you know 100% to do all this. And then after that, it, it dozed off into nothing. And then finally, we can get task statistics information. So each of the different interrupts, the scheduler, low and high priority tasks, and even the idle task, we can get stack information, run counts, frequencies, we can get the min and max run times, along with a bunch of other data that can help us verify that our applications behave in the way that we expect it to. Now, when you're using a real-time operating system and you want to do application tracing like this, I think one of the, the greatest uses for this is to go through and discover, you know, some of the three major, three or four major RTOS dangers that you might find. So for example, priority inversion. A priority inversion occurs when a high priority task is blocked by a lower priority task. This usually occurs when you have a high priority task uh, sharing a resource and you're, you're synchronizing the tasks via semaphore, for example. And what happens here, you can even see in this example, the, co the code is running, we have a low priority task. It actually takes a semaphore down here that the high priority task needs. It gets interrupted here because the high priority task needs to execute, but suddenly it doesn't have access to that. So it needs to then wait for the semaphore. The low priority task comes back in, starts executing, it completes and then gives it back. So if you have a semaphore and that type of behavior happening, we have this priority inversion happening right here in this area of our application, which we're able to visually see. Now there's of course different ways to avoid priority inversion, such as using a mutex with priority inheritance, which can uh, you know, temporarily lower the priority, the lowest priority task, and promote it up to the same priority level as the block task. That's a great way to help minimize the impact of the priority inversion. And another feature that I think uh, is very useful about tracing, about the second pillar of application analysis, is that we can go through and we can verify timing. I've kind of already mentioned that just probably based on this timing information that's provided, you could determine whether you have priority inversions or deadlocks or threat starvation occurring. Just by coming in and looking at a particular task and saying, okay, here's my high priority task. This is how many times it was executed. Does it make sense that it was executed this many times compared to some of these other tasks? If it does, okay, cool. Is the, does the frequency make sense? Like I was saying, if I'm expecting this to be at 20 hertz and it's really at two, I know something funny is going on in my application 
and then I can try to start setting up tests to go in and visualize the areas where that's occurring and capture the event data and figure out what's actually happening to cause that particular issue. We can then even get min runtime, maximum runtime, which we can then feed back into our original analysis. Remember when we did our rate monotonic scheduling analysis, we assumed certain execution times for our tasks. If they turn out to be far longer or much less, then we might want to go back and make adjustments to that and change the priorities of our application code. So, you know, these types of this type of information can feed back into our analysis and help make sure that we come to a good conclusion and a good robust system. So let's now go and actually see how we can use system view and analyze a real-time operating system application. In order to perform application tracing, there's two pieces of information that we're going to need. First, we're going to have to actually run our application code on the target development board, and we're going to want to include some libraries that can communicate back to System Viewer, which is the second piece of software we need to be running. So on the target, if you take a look in our application code under the setup folder here, I mentioned earlier that we have these Seger files right here. Now the RTT is how is called real-time transfer, and this is the, the code that's going to very quickly and efficiently communicate up into our JTrace device. And then we have a couple of libraries here for System View, which is going to help communicate context-specific information to the software as well. Now you can see here when we originally looked at this that hey our entire project is 23.5k which might seem like it's you know pretty big for an application that doesn't do a whole lot but as you can see for a production intent system we really wouldn't include these additional files that allow us to do real-time tracing of the application code that would be a security risk and as you can see here the module that communicates with system view is 12.1k of code space so out of that 23.5k almost half of it is related to just being able to transmit up our data. Now, as it turns out, RTT is actually extraordinarily fast. It can transmit data in you know microseconds or less. So this has very little overhead in our application code. And when we perform real-time trades, we'll actually see that in the timestamps as we look through that a lot of our application is going to be idle and that there really isn't any effect from these libraries communicating the trace data back up to our application code. Now, in order to successfully get System Viewer to receive data, the first thing we're going to do is actually start up our application and get it in the run state. Now, at this point, it's ready to run. I also want to enable System Viewer, so I'm going to open System Viewer up. I'm going to go ahead and hit run here. It's going to ask me how I want to communicate to get the, the live streaming data. Uh, I'm using going to use a USB interface. I'm communicating with an MK66, which is what's on the M Power board. This is going to be over serial wired debugging interface. We're going to let it auto detect and automatically search for the RTT and all the control blocks that are associated with it automatically in memory. So those Sager RTT blocks will create a little memory buffer in memory that's going to store the different event data that's going to get then transmitted back up the system viewer and allow us to see what's happening in our application code. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And as you can see, nothing exciting has happened yet. But what I need to do first is actually go back into my IDE that has my application code. It's sitting there waiting in main. So what I'm going to do is off screen, I'm going to go ahead and hit run. And then you're going to see the interface start filling out with information and the data for different events that are occurring inside of our system. So I'm going to let this run for a little bit. You can see once again, real time data. You can see the run counts changing. You can see the total run times. You can see that the, the event data here, the graph filled up and also the timeline filled up. So I'm going to take a little snapshot here and then I'm going to hit the stop button. Now at this point, I've acquired a trace of my application code. And what I want to do is go in and see if it actually behaved the way that I wanted it to. So one of the ways that I can do this is I can actually go through and I can look through the different events. And I can click on them here to see what's actually happening. You can see there's a bunch of system descriptions. And you can see here that as I start going through these different events, I move through the timeline uh, below. So what I can do here is I can actually zoom in. I'm just going to roll here. And you can see the different events that are happening here. So you can see right here as I move in, this is going to be our system tick. So we have a system tick over here on the left hand side. You can see there's been some calculations done for us. How many times it actually ran throughout the whole application, what its frequency is, there's an ID associated with it, and also then uh, typical and minimum and maximum times that it required to execute. We can see here the how much time the actual scheduler is taking to execute. And we can see the two tasks that we created in our application, the LED gatekeeper task and the LED controller task. 
And then, of course, we have an idle task that runs when there are no other tasks that need to execute and the scheduler isn't running. And you can see here the order that, have, that the tasks execute. So right here we have a system take event occurs. Then we go into the scheduler for a little bit. We have the LED task then that, that executes. You can see these little blocks here actually represent additional events. So the first event here is that we enter into the actual task. We then try to get the OS, uh, we make a call to OSQ get pointer condition. And then we, once we're able to do that, we, we continue executing. We then purge because we've executed our code. And then we leave the task and delay for the, the in this case, 50 uh, milliseconds. So you can see here that each of the events that are occurring in a task, these little hash marks are actually representing them. Just by putting my cursor over, I can see how long that task took to execute in this iteration. Once a task completed, the scheduler then runs to figure out what should be the next task that executes. In this sequence, it says, oh, the LED controller task should go next. So we come in here, we can see, okay, this is the next one due. And the next, the next event it does is it's going to put more data into that message queue that will then be received later on by the gatekeeper task when it's ready to execute again. And then another OS delay is called. The scheduler calls, and then we enter into the idle task here. And then if I scroll out a little bit, we can then see what's going on here. We can see, oh, a system tick occurs next. I can come back over here and go through this to see the different events. I can scroll through. Oh, there's a system tick. Not a whole lot occurs for a while, just a bunch of system ticks. So we enter and exit the system tick for a while. Eventually, we would get back down to where we have the next tasks start executing. So you can see right here, we, once again, we end up with that nice similar type of sequence. If I wanted to, I could also scroll back out and I can visually look to see if I see any strange behavior in my code that I wouldn't expect to see. And if, for example, I saw something strange, I could then zoom in on it and try to figure out what exactly is going on. Now, the nice thing too is we have some additional information that we can find down here. We can see actually what the CPU load is. So this little area of the screen is showing us our CPU load for the different tasks. But if we really wanna get some good context information, this context window is the best one here at the very bottom. It shows all the different activities that are occurring in our system, the system tick, the scheduler, our two LED, uh, LED gatekeeper and LED controller tasks and the idle task. It actually provides us with the stack information here. We can see here that these that this is a higher priority than this one. So it gives us our task priority levels. And then it tells us how many times that the tasks were actually executed. This can be very useful if I expect two tasks to be running at the same rate, at the same run count, but I suddenly discover that one, you know, there's fewer counts for one task than the other, that could indicate that there's a problem or a bug in the software. Just like the same thing with the frequency. If I'm expecting the LED gatekeeper task to execute at a faster frequency than the LED controller, then but just by looking at this, I can say, hey, you know what? Maybe there's something wrong with the actual code or there's a bug somewhere. And visualizing these events in this manner makes it very easy to spot strange behaviors in our software. There's also then some very useful information from a real time standpoint. A lot of times we just develop our code, we cross our fingers and we hope for the best. We assume that we understand the timing of the different tasks throughout our system. It's very possible that we could end up with contentions or areas where our code is taking longer to execute than we expect it to. As we're tracing our application code, we're getting timestamps back in the events of when we enter a task, exit a task, and the events that are occurring inside that task. So that means we can get minimum runtime information. So for example, I know that the gatekeeper task, the minimum time that it executed was 0.0348 milliseconds. The maximum runtime was 0 0.0385. If I was expecting this to always be below 0 0.3 as part of a requirement, I would know that I need to go in and try to adjust that task in order to meet my real-time requirements and make sure that my system remains deterministic. The nice thing about this too then is I can also come in and look at the runtime uh, per second and I can start to see the actual percentage that the different tasks are executing. So you can see here that um, you know the minimum runtime if I'm using the minimum runtime, which we typically probably wouldn't do in an analysis, we actually want to use the maximum time. But we can see that, you know, at a minimum, we're using a 6% 6, 6 load of this 0.06% of the CPU for the gatekeeper task and as much as 0.08% at the maximum runtime. So we can go through here and say, okay, you know what? We're not overtaxing our CPU. There's no reason we should run out of clock cycles. And we can design our, you know, we know that our software isn't going to run into issues at least related to, you know, CPU overload which makes this far more efficient and easy to see what's going on in our application, and we don't have to guess. Once we've gone through as developers and we've got a good application that's 
been tested. We want to still go through and verify that everything is correct. Visual inspection is one thing, but performing a code profile with test cases to make sure that we hit every line of code and every instruction gets tested is a completely different story. In my experience, generally embed software developers have been pretty bad at testing applications. We're really good at spot checking to make things that in, make sure that in general everything works, but we really don't get 100% code coverage, which means the odds are there's bugs that are in every single one of our applications. And this is one of the things that really excites me about this whole deep insight analysis is that this third pillar allows us to do uh, code profiling and instruction tracing and really make sure that we're fully testing our system. And then at that point, we should have a really good, robust application. To perform this part of the deep insight analysis, this verification and this code profiling to get that real deep insight into how my application is behaving, what I have right here in front of us is the Ozone J-Link Debugger version 2.5 which is a standalone graphical debugger. The cool thing about this is that it can load any debug output from any tool chain or IDE. And what it is gonna allow us to do is look at instruction tracing, look at code profiling, and really allow us to verify that our application is performing the way that we expect it to. So one of the things that you would do with this is I would create a whole bunch of test cases, run my code, run the test cases, and then I could see whether I actually hit every single line of code in my test cases. So I'll be able to find out, did I actually test function startup to its complete 100%? If not, it means that there could potentially be a bug hiding in my code that I wasn't even aware of. Now, in order to get real deep insights like this and get real-time streaming so I can see how the code is behaving, the real recommended way to do this is to use a JTrace. And the JTrace has an ETM on board, a bunch of channels to be able to stream, stream data over to the Ozone tool in real time so I can see what's actually happening. Now, JTrace up on uh, the Sager website has a tutorial associated with it to get this up and running very easily. So what I'm gonna do is open that tutorial and you can see here I have two different choices. The JTrace comes with a little reference board that allows you to really quickly test out the JTrace capabilities and go through an example and see the code profiling and how it all works. Since I have an Empower board and that's the other option, that's the, one, that's the file I'm gonna load into the IDE. And you can see here when I do this, it looks like just about any other debugger that maybe you've used in the past. But the cool thing about this is that this one is separate from the compiler. So I'm just, I'm not allowing myself to compile the code. I'm just wanting to perform verification and get some new insights into my application. So you can see here, I have some uh, source code here. I have an instruction trace window up in the upper left. It says no target currently connected. When I loaded the debug file, it performed an analysis here. And it, look, you can see here, I have different symbol names, different functions. I can see where they're located in the memory, their size, how many instructions are associated with them, and even the source module from which they come. And then of course, I'm gonna have this little code profile window, which I haven't started running my actual application yet. So there's no information or data. So one of the first things I'm gonna do is actually run this. You can see I just loaded this application onto the development board. It has already executed till main, which means it's gone through and already executed some instructions. And you can see the, over here in the instruction trace, these are all the instructions have been executed so far. So I can come up here and scroll up and see the different areas of memory that have been already ran. Now, a lot of these instructions are gonna be, of course, in assembly, and they may not have a, since it is startup code, it may not have real C code associated with it. But what I can do to actually take a look at that is since I'm at the start of main, one of the things I can do is perform a step over and I can see here, I just stepped in the main. So we can see here the C code, main entry. Here's the instructions that were executed. I can go and do this again. Here's the next set. We actually set count equal to zero. So you can see here count equals zero. And these were the instructions that were executed in the CPU. So if for some reason I wanted to, I could actually go back and verify every single instruction that was executed by my code, or if I wanted to verify perhaps that the compiler was behaving the way I expected it to, I could do a real low level dive and see what's actually happening in the CPU. Now, of course I could step again here and you can see here that I have uh, executed a couple, a couple lines of code. I can actually right click here and say execute counters. And you can see here, it'll actually tell me how many times a particular line of code has been executed. So that's actually a really cool thing. So I can see here that count equals zero was executed once, BSP init was executed once, BSP set LED, this hasn't been executed yet. It's got a zero right next to it. 
So if I go through and I step over this line of code, it suddenly changes to a one. And while we get into these while loops, you can see here, if I ju just jump through lines of code here, you can see that I get a change there of how many times the code was actually executed. Now, if I go through and I actually run this code and just let the application run, you can see here, I'm getting real time trace data coming out of my CPU from my application, showing me how many times these different functions have been executed. So you can see here that test function to count this decrement has already almost been executed 20, 20 million times. It just passed that. We're approaching 25 million now. And this is all happening in real time. And the cool thing about this is I can come over to my code profiling window and you can see here the different functions that are in my application and I can see the source coverage and the instruction coverage. Now, for every single line of C code that's generated, it doesn't mean that it's only going to generate a single instruction associated with it. There could be more instructions. So we get this deep insight here of source coverage versus instruction coverage of the application. And we're seeing here our run count, a fetch count, and even the load of the CPU. So we can see here that, hey, you know what? Test function two is actually using up most of the CPU load. 99.93% .93 of, of all the instructions being generated or the CPU load here is right there in that function. And if I wanted to, I could even sort these here. So you can see here, I can go through and verify, ah, my BSP init function was covered 100% in my test cases. So this is where, you know, verification of our application is very important. If I want to make sure that I have hit every single line of code in my application, there used to be no way to do that. You just had to guess and kind of hope, cross your fingers that I actually covered all the lines of code and that there isn't a bug hiding in my code somewhere. Using this tool, using JTrace and, and Ozone here, I can literally run my code, run my test cases, and determine, uh-oh, where, where's the holes in my test cases? I should have maybe covered BSP set LED 100%, not 75. So this is where this tool could be extraordinarily useful for verifying our applications and just getting an insight into what's actually executing. Maybe I wasn't expecting test function two to be executing millions or billions of times compared to some of these other functions. I would never know that if I couldn't see this data and actually then go back and analyze it, which is another thing that I like about this. I can actually come and pause. And if I just click in here on any of these grids, I can export all this information uh, as either a report or a CSV file. And I can go back and then analyze it further to understand exactly how my application is behaving and maybe where I need to make changes or make updates to my test cases so that I can get 100% coverage. So I hope as you can imagine, this could be extraordinarily useful, especially if we're trying to develop secure or very robust applications. Now we've walked through a lot of different things in today's webinar. We've literally started out at the RTOS selection process, moved into doing a brief review of real-time operating system concepts. We set up a real-time operating system, MOS. What are some of the key takeaways that we should be thinking about here from deep insight analysis best practices? So the first thing that we should think about, we want to make sure that we follow an RTOS application best practices when we're creating our applications, such as using rate monotonic scheduling for initial task priorities, minimizing dynamic memory allocation, things like that. Um, if you aren't aware of what real-time operating system best practices are, I have put together a little guide that you can find on my website if you just visit uh, beningo.com. Beyond RTOS, best practices though, some, th some little key tips and tricks for you. We looked at, I showed you briefly this uh, for OS aware debugging. We want to make sure that we go through and we monitor and properly size the stack for each task. A lot of times people just guess at the stack size. It's a horrible way to either size it too small or even more likely just way oversize it and run out of memory. So OS aware debugging can really help us size that stack up properly. We also want to make sure I showed you how we could use that OS error in the MOS to discover issues uh, that the, the operating system are catching. A good tip there is actually set a breakpoint in that OS error handler when you first start your code. That way, uh, as you saw in the demonstration, we just had kind of had an LED stop and we're like, well, what's going on? And we had to pause our code. So instead, if you set a breakpoint there, we'll hit a breakpoint and immediately know, ah, there's something wrong that we need to go and investigate. Next, we want to make sure that we set up real-time tracing at the start of a project so that we can create application profiles and compare them over time. I'm a big fan of setting up all of our debugging tools, all of our tracing, assertions, printfs, you name it, at the start before we ever write a single line of code. It really allows us then to, with every step, every function we create, go in and look and see how the system is behaving. And then if we do that periodically enough, 
if I make a change that's bad for the system and it ruins the CPU load or the way the tasks interact, I can discover that immediately instead of waiting months to go back and say, oh, there's something not right. Oh, well, this is going on. Well, what happened here again? And then you spend, you know, two days trying to remember that area of the code. If instead you do that from the beginning and you constantly check this, you'll find bugs immediately. You'll know exactly what lines of code that, that you just changed. It makes things go a lot faster. We also want to make sure that we use that application analysis context information for min and max execution times. And we feed that back into our original uh, priority scheduling uh, techniques that we were using. So I think that's just a great way to verify our real-time performance on our system. I think it's also a good way to see hints of issues with the way that we've set up our tasks or our, the way our application was designed. As I mentioned, if you have a priority inversion, you, you'd probably start, or even a deadlock or something like that, or thread starvation, you'd be able to see that in those code profiling numbers. And um, you know that context information provides a lot of detailed information there. Even though it just looks like a couple simple numbers, there's a lot we can get there. Especially if we're checking these things periodically and recording them so that we have data to go back and compare against. Use code profiling uh, while developing test cases to ensure that test case coverage is 100% for both source and instructions. A great way to develop test cases is to write them while you develop your code. And while you're doing that, you can be running trace information to make sure that you're actually creating those test cases to cover everything. And then at the end of the development cycle, you should be able to just run all those test cases again, run the scan, and make sure that your profiles all hit 100% where you expect them to. And finally, don't wait until the end of your project or the, near the very end to start using deep insight analysis. These are techniques that are, uh, in my opinion, cutting edge. They provide us a lot of insight into the way our, our applications are behaving and they can save us a lot of time and headaches and stress by showing us what's going on in our system immediately when it actually occurs. So use those as the, you know, the tools of the best of your ability. Uh, I know that I found that it has been saving me a lot of time in debugging my systems um, for my own clients and applications. So at this point, we're nearing the end of our lecture. Uh, we're going to have questions here in just a moment, but I do want to let you know if you want to go further, there's a couple of different things you can do. You might want to follow along again with, uh, with the recording when I send it out. Uh, so in that case, if you're going to try to follow along, you might want to take a look at the Sager.com website, download the uh, JTrace tutorial and code, get Embed Studio, download MOS, and download System View. Like I mentioned, I showed these tools all with Empower, but they work with you know, pick whatever development kit is your favorite. System View works, you know, with even low level um, or very low cost debuggers. Uh, sometimes even the, the J-Link on boards, you can easily get trace information out. So definitely try those out uh, and, and get a feel for how they work and understand these new techniques that you can use to, to understand your application code. You can also download from my website, the uh, demonstration project. So I'm, I'm putting all the source code for the, the little examples that I put together with the uh, LED control and the gatekeeper. Up on the website, there's also some uh, seed oxygen templates, my RTOS best practice guide, and uh, links to other webinars I've done in the past. If you need a refresher on real-time operating systems, for example, I've got a webinar that you can go and watch there on my website as well. Thank you again for all of your time and attention today. You guys have been a great audience. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, at this time, I will go over into the, uh, the chat window there and answer any questions that you might have. Thanks again and have a great day.